One, two, one, two. What's happening, everybody? This is another edition of TK's Two Cents coming at you live, Revolution of One. Today, I want to talk about building the Mamba mentality. Uh, we've got, um, I just want to focus on Kobe today because, you know, there, there's a, a Kobe campaign that's going to be, um, that, that that's happening right now. And so a lot of people are talking about him and I'll take advantage of any excuse to talk about my man, Kobe Bryant, because he's been a huge inspiration to me. And I think anybody that is a student of greatness, um, I think he, you know, really modeled what it means to, to work hard, to be a great learner, and to be someone who sets himself up to actualize his potential. And I think there are so many life lessons we can learn from uh, KB24. So building a Mamba mentality, I'm going to try to move through these pretty quickly, but I'm going to give five quick lessons on how to build a Mamba mentality. So let's start off with number one. Number one is be a student of the game. One of the things that Kobe talked about in his book, Mamba Mentality, was that he worked very hard to not only play on the court, but to do things off the court that would make him a more intelligent basketball player. So one of the interesting stories in his book that he talks about is how there is a handbook that all of the NBA referees have. And he got a hold of one of those handbooks and he studied it in and out. And one of the things he discovered is that there are certain kinds of rules that determine the positioning of a referee on the floor. And when referees are in certain positions, it creates dead zones or blind spots where the referees just can't see certain places on the floor. So whenever you see the referee standing in those positions, they are going to be less likely to see a travel, to see a foul or any of those types of things. And so Kobe was able to take advantage of those blind spots or those dead zones by memorizing them. And he was able to he was able to look at a referee in the middle of a game and based on the positioning of the referee, know how he might be able to break a rule, bend a rule or create some kind of opportunity for himself. Now, that to me is a classic example of how you can create uncommon opportunities and advantages for yourself by being willing to study the things that other people might say, oh, that's not even important. You don't need to know that. Kobe dared to study the stuff that you don't need to know. To me, this is one of the most important lessons about success. In order to be successful, you've got to go beyond what is necessary. You have to go beyond, you know, is this required for the test? Uh, is this something that I have to do? Will I be punished for not doing it? You've got to take all of those things that everyone will forgive you for not doing. You've got to take all those things that are, aren't necessary, aren't going to be on the test, aren't part of your job description, and you've got to study those things and master those things so that you can be able to bring a level of excellence to whatever it is you do. Kobe not only did things like that, but he made sure that he studied other players. He was known for watching hours and hours of game tape in order to just study what went wrong in the games that he played and study what went right in the games that others play. One of my favorite memories of him is, you know, they're playing the Chicago Bulls shortly before Michael Jordan retires. Jordan does a move on him. Kobe comes back and they're standing like near half court. And Kobe is in the middle of a game asking Michael Jordan, hey, how did you do that move? He's getting advice from his hero in the middle of a game. There was never a moment for him that was inappropriate to learning. And for students of the game, you value being great more than you value looking smart. And sometimes you got to choose between those two things. You can get so caught up in trying to impress people and trying to look successful that you forget to do the things that, that, that actually will help you become successful. And what is that thing? Being a student of the game. What's the game you're playing? And whose work do you need to know about? And what are the other ways that you can study what it is you do so that you can achieve a new level of mastery? Let's go to the next lesson. The next one is never stop learning. So this is an extension of always be a student of the game, you know, but it's easy when you have mastered something, when you've read a lot, when you've practiced a lot to get to this point where you feel like, hey, I've arrived where Kobe never had that I have arrived mindset. Even after becoming a perennial all-star, even after winning multiple championships, 
putting himself in a situation where it's like, yo, man, no matter what happens from this point on, you are going to make the Hall of Fame. He still kept pushing himself to achieve new levels. One of my favorite video clips, and you can check this out on YouTube, is Kobe walking into a college in Boston and sitting in the back and everybody's like freaking out. Oh my God, what's Kobe doing at this college? Well, he was already in the NBA, already well into his career, and he was taking courses on marketing and finance. And when he was asked about why, he says, because there's always new tricks and techniques that I'm trying to learn. I'm already running multiple businesses. I'm already marketing various ventures. I already know a lot of things from experience, but I'm trying to study as much as I can and learn from interacting with different people and asking different questions and so forth. That's the mindset that is often referred to in Zen as beginner's mind. You know, there's so much pressure today to make yourself look like an expert, to position yourself as an expert, to position yourself as somebody that has it all together. Well, the experts of the future, the experts that will inspire and lead in the world that is emerging in front of our very eyes are the experts that are willing to present themselves as curious, as sincere, and as transparent. Hey, I know some things, but I don't know everything, and I'm going to interact with everybody that I engage as if I have something to learn from them. Let's go to number two. Number three. Number three is pursue your dreams with biblical dedication. So this comes from Kobe's, Kobe's Mamba mentality where he talked about his workout routine and he said that he worked out biblically, like he treated his workout like it was a religion. It wasn't something that he could afford to compromise or not take seriously. Sometimes he had bad days. Sometimes he had people say to him things like, hey, Kobe, I'm sure you can take a day off. You don't need to work out today. It ain't that serious. And he still did it anyway. And he treated it like a religion. He got up every morning at five to be able to hit that weight room and hit that gym. He made sure that after the game, he was spending time watching the film tape and so forth. This reminds me of a phrase that's often used by Seth Godin called the power of showing up. And one of the things that he talks about a lot, you know, when it comes to this theme is we overestimate the value of being seen and we underestimate the value of showing up. We think success is about being seen and being recognized when really success is about showing up and being consistent day in and day out. If you can be the kind of person who shows up consistently, you will pass the kind of person who is always easily seen because being seen isn't sustainable, but showing up sustains itself. You know, um, in Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art, one of the things he talks about is how we're willing to show up for the jobs that we have to do, but we're not willing to show up for our dreams. So as an example, he says, you know, let's say you work at a restaurant and you're a server at a restaurant and you don't really feel that well, but you push yourself and you go to work anyway because you need the money or you're scared of your boss being upset or firing you for calling in. Or sometimes you go to work and you don't really feel enthusiastic. You don't feel inspired, but you know what? You go through the motions anyway. You, you serve the food, you take the orders, you do your side work, you sweep the floors, you take out the garbage, you give the best that you can give, even if it's not a great effort. But then when it comes to our art, when it comes to our dreams, when it comes to our creative labor, we say, nah, I'm not gonna show up unless I feel really inspired. We're, well, Kobe's idea of being biblical with your workout routine, being biblical with the stuff that you got to do to achieve your dreams, it's basically the idea that says show up no matter what in season and out of season and treat your dreams with the same respect that you treat your job. Don't show up to your job and work hard even when you're not inspired because you need the money and then bail out on your dreams because you demand that you feel amazing before you do that work. Treat your creative labor with the same respect that you treat the labor that you do for your job. Show up all the time. Be biblical about it. Treat it like a religion. Be loyal. Be dedicated. Be committed. Have faith because it's your life that's on the line. And if you turn out to live a life that you're not happy with, that you don't want, nobody pays that price but you. So get biblical with it. Let's, next lesson. Let's talk about failure. This is one of my favorite Kobe quotes. Once you know what failure feels like, determination chases success. 
Now, you know, quotes are a funny thing today because everybody's got them, right? You go on Instagram, you go on Twitter, there's a ton of success quotes. But all of these quotes are sort of distilled lessons that come from stories, that come from great lives. And I think more valuable than the quotes are the stories that give context to these insights. You know, um, so one of my favorite Kobe stories comes from in his rookie year. It was a playoff game uh, against the Utah Jazz. Kobe wasn't even like considered to be the most clutch person on his team at this time. He had a couple of guys that had a little more experience than him. But Kobe, you could see that he had something special. And that something special was the willingness to take his shot, the willingness to give his best, the willingness to play with confidence. Well, this was a day where that confidence seemed to fail him. They're going up against the Utah Jazz. I believe it was 1997. And Kobe, in the last five minutes of the game, Kobe gets a chance to take four big shots that can make a big difference in this game. The first shot, he gets the ball, air ball. Second shot, he gets it, air ball. Third attempt, he gets it, air ball. There's a fourth attempt that he gets. With the game on the line, his team down by three, he hits this shot, they can at least tie the game and maybe send it into overtime. His teammate passes him the ball. Kobe is pretty much open for the three-pointer. He takes the shot, yet another air ball. And I remember watching that game and thinking to myself, wow, this guy is going to be one of the greatest players to ever play the game because he took every single one of those shots as if the one he took before it was something other than an air ball. Another favorite uh, Kobe antidote is um, there's a player uh, named Darren Williams who once went 0 for 9, shot nine shots, missed every single one of them. And Kobe told him, never allow yourself to go 0 for 9. If, if anything, go 0 for 16. Because if you go 0 for 9, that basically means you stopped yourself. It means that you shot a bunch of shots, you missed, you lost confidence, and you stopped shooting. Never give up. Never stop taking your shot. It's better to go 0 for 16 than to go 0 for 9. Keep taking your shot. And that's something that Kobe did and was criticized for even throughout his career, criticized because he never lost confidence when it came to taking a shot. We all have things that we want to take a shot at, but sometimes when we fail, sometimes when we miss that shot, and sometimes we miss it in an embarrassing way, we say, oh, I just better chill. I, I better not get ahead of myself. I better sit down and relax. I better go sit and hide in the back of the classroom. I better go bench myself. Don't bench yourself. Better to go 0 for 16 than 0 for 9. Keep taking your shot. Next lesson. Take the pressure. Another Kobe quote, everything negative, pressure, challenges, it's all an opportunity for me to rise. When Kobe Bryant first came into the league and he was a young, young, young star, young rising talent, he played with Shaquille O'Neal, who was an older, more experienced teammate the captain of the team, the MVP for all the finals that they won together. And Kobe won three NBA titles alongside Shaq. And Los Angeles loved Shaquille O'Neal. But sometimes Kobe and Shaq didn't get along. And there were some things that happened in the team, you know, some disagreement, some dissension. And the Lakers made their choice. The Lakers decided to trade Shaquille O'Neal to the Miami Heat, and they decide to bank their future on Kobe Bryant. And at that time, people may pretend not to remember this now because, you know, when you retire or, you know, when you transition, people only say the positive things about you. But Kobe took a lot of heat and a lot of criticism in his career. And this was a point where he took a ton of it because a lot of basketball fans blamed Kobe Bryant for breaking up the Lakers dynasty. They blamed him for Shaq getting traded to Miami. And people said if Kobe really wanted to fight for him, he could have used his clout. He could have used his power to say, no, 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 I want to keep Shaq. Now, later on, Shaq came out and said, look, it wasn't Kobe's fault. That, that really didn't have anything to do with him. But at that time, Kobe was blamed for it. You want to talk about pressure. I even remember Lakers great Magic Johnson was on TV one time saying, all right, Kobe, you want your own team? You want to be the main man? All right, you have it now. 
Maybe you should call up Allen Iverson and see what that's like to be the best guy on the team, to be the only star. And Kobe had all of these warnings about it ain't all that it's cracked up to be the, to be the main guy on the team. And that next year, Shaq's new team, the Miami Heat, they did pretty good. Year after that, they won the NBA championship. Kobe's team, they struggled. And Kobe had to go through a lot of frustration. And so the pressure mounted even more. Here's this guy. Everybody's blaming you for losing. That guy leaves, goes to another team, wins the championship without you. But Kobe stuck with it. He persisted. And eventually he went on to not only get the talent that he needed around him to compliment him, but to win two more championships without Shaq. Shaq ended up with four championships. Kobe ended up with five. And after his final game, one of the things he said was that, I'm glad that I did it the right way. I'm glad that I didn't leave to go be with a better team. I'm glad I didn't take the easy way out. I'm glad I went through the pressure and I learned how to win in spite of the pressure. That's true of the game of life. You know, sometimes you got to take heat in order to chase after your dream, in order to accomplish the things that you want in life. Uh, nobody promised that it would be easy. Nobody promised that everybody would say, yay, when you announce your dreams. Sometimes you'll get blamed for things that you don't deserve the blame for. Sometimes you'll get criticized in a way that seems unfair. But if you're willing to play through the pressure and focus on creating the results that matter most to you, rather than on avoiding booze from the crowd, you can bring home whatever your version of the ring is as well. All right, I'm gonna stop right there. Those are a few tips on how to build a mama mentality. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know if you want me to do this again. And in the meantime, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, 12 p.m. Eastern time, the revolution of one live streams. I am here live. I announced the schedule every Monday so that you know what's going on for that week. I look forward to seeing y'all Tuesday, 12 p.m. Peace.